I am thrilled and honored to have an opportunity to speak to a someone, a, a scholar in our field who's been pioneering in his work over many decades. And we at NYU had the good fortune uh, to collaborate with him most recently on his new book, America and the Making of an Independent Ireland. I'm speaking about uh, Francis M. Carroll. Uh, Francis, before I go any further, welcome uh, to our interview uh, platform for today. And mm -hmm. always a pleasure to, to have an opportunity to chat to you. Thank you. I'm delighted to uh, to be here and to have a chance to talk with you. We've been talking about doing this chat for a while, Francis. So I'm great. I'm de I'm delighted that we've, um, and and it was mostly my fault that we were slower than we would have liked doing it. So thanks for carving out the time. I'll just by way of introduction, um, Francis is the is professor emeritus at the University of Manitoba and a fellow of Saint John's College, where he taught history. He is author of a number of books on Irish history, including Money for Ireland, Finance, Diplomacy, Politics, The First Stall Aaron Loans, 1919 to 1936, and The American Commission on Independence, 1919, The Diary, Correspondence and Report. And of course, today we're speaking about America and the making of independent Ireland, a history. Sorry, I forgot the subtitle in my original introduction. And it was published by NYU Press. Gosh, now it's a year out, yes. I guess, Francis, isn't it? Um, which we, we were so delighted. It's been our first, our inaugural, uh, our book, first book in the Duxman Ireland House series uh, with NYU Press. And it was a wonderful collab collaboration with NYU Press and, of course, with Francis. Um, I know a little bit about the origins of this book, um, Francis, specifically and more generally as it speaks to your work in the field. But for people tuning in today, can you tell us a little bit about how you came on the topic of this wonderful book? Well, thank you. And, and I, I'm so delighted that NYU has, has published the book. I'm, I'm very pleased and, and flattered. Uh, and I'm very pleased with the book. It, it, uh, the press has done a wonderful job uh, with it, I think. Uh, and I'm, I'm delighted to have a, a, a platform to pull together uh, the various strains of this story of how the United States, uh, both in its uh, Irish American community and in its general public and the um, various forms of the US government, I think contributed uh, in various ways to the uh, uh, to the creation of a self-governing and independent uh, Ireland. It's, it's a marvelous, but very tangled and complex story. So it's been fun to have a, an opportunity to try to put it together. So you pick up the story, Francis, in, you know, the period of just over 100 years ago, but for our people tuning in who aren't as familiar with that, you know, can you set out the context of these connections, you know, in the night, late 19th century and into the early 20th century, or maybe pick it up from, um, you know, the, I guess, 1916 period in particular is when um, things really kind of solidify a little bit? Well, the, uh, the, the, <laughs> the story really begins, I think, with uh, the enormous uh, migration uh, of the Irish community to North America, largely to the United States, but of course to Canada as well, in the aftermath of the Great Famine of the 1840s. And by the end of the 19th century, there's this amazing statistic of as many people alive in the, in the United States who were born in Ireland uh, or had at least one parent born in Ireland as lived in Ireland itself. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's this, and, and this constituted a huge uh, proportion of the US population by the early 20th century. Perhaps 20 million uh, people claimed Irish descent, which was about 20% to 21% of the uh, US population. So here's this enormous community, uh, very dynamic and, and lively, 
and, and in many ways well organized as ethnic groups, both politically, socially, and, and ecclesiastically. So they were in a position to, to make uh, an influence both in uh, domestic American politics and in trying to shape uh, affairs in Ireland as well. And for the most part, they were consistent, this community was consistently uh, in favor of Irish self-government of one kind or another. And it went back and forth between republicanism and some, for, some form of government within the, uh, the British system, whichever looked like it was most likely to come into effect. So there, there is this movement right throughout the 19th and into the early 20th century, uh, trying to push events um, towards some kind of workable conclusion. And of course, that really culminates uh, in these events in the early 20th century, first with the Home Rule Movement, which looks like it's going to su succeed uh, and is uh, diverted or preempted by uh, unionist opposition, and then the outbreak of the First World War. So that 1916, in some respects, comes as a surprise, although you, you know, as, as historians, we might say, well, it wasn't a surprise, but uh, in many respects, it diverted attention and, and what, probability away from what had seemed like the home rule solution uh, to Irish uh, political aspirations. And 1916 really does become a turning point, not immediately obvious, but certainly as, as months went on and, and uh, attempts to, to restart the home rule movement faltered, uh, independence of some kind, uh, rather than self-government within uh, the, the United Kingdom uh, became increasingly the, uh, the object of Irish nationalist aspirations. It's interesting, Francis, I had the pleasure of having some of these conversations with you uh, when we had the good fortune of having you at NYU around the time of us marking the centenary of 1916 and then indeed our publication Ireland's Allies to which you contributed a wonderful uh, chapter and the you know your chapter in Ireland's Allies makes that um, very powerful kind of um, uh, uh, argument, I suppose, about uh, how embedded the home rule journey had, was in terms of the Irish American community and how, um, as you point out, you know, on some levels, unlikely it would be that things would shift in the way that they did in in the run up to 1960, not even just the event itself, right? It seems like the, the, the speech in Wooden Bridge in September 1914 is very damaging to um, Redmond's aspirations in Irish America uh, at that time, if I remember correctly, right? Oh, oh yes, quite, quite correct, yes. And um, no, it, it is an amazing turn of events. Uh, and even, even before the outbreak of the First World War, you can hear complaints uh, from people within the Irish American community that, that the home rule process seems to have faltered, which indeed it, it, it had. Mm -hmm. uh, tragically, if you like, um, uh, <laughs> fortunately, if you prefer, mm -hmm. uh, so that e events, what, what looked like a, a done deal, if I can use that expression, really began to fall apart. Uh, yeah, and, and, and I suppose also then the slight sometimes how things reverberate in a historical perspective, sometimes differently, say, for example, in Ireland to how they might in the diaspora. It's not exactly the same kind of responses right away in both places, right? That, uh, you know, yes. there's a bit of divergence there. Yes. Well, I think for one thing, especially as, as the war broke out, uh, people had to be very careful in Ireland about expressing their uh, their sentiments because to to uh, uh, to push for independence in the face of the national crisis of the war 
uh, would uh, would uh, raise questions of loyalty and uh, possible treason. So it, it's clear that that people were much more cautious. Uh, and of course, we know thousands of, of Irish uh, uh, citizens uh, volunteered in the British Army. Uh, so there was a, a, a strong move in that direction. Uh, and in that sense, too, the, uh, the rising uh, and more importantly, perhaps the suppression of the rising really began to, uh, uh, to change the climate in Ireland as well as in uh, the United States. And in the United States, of course, the advantage they have is that they can speak more freely or gather more freely in, in, in that vein, right? Which would, which would make the difference. For, for another 12 months, but of course, when the United States entered the war in April of, of 1917, uh, the Irish community had to be very guarded in what they said about right. <laughs> the, the, the British ally, which, was, uh, uh, which made life you know, very complicated and, and dangerous. Mm -hmm. So you pick up, you largely pick up in America and the making of an independent Ireland, Francis, chronologically, it, and uh, it, it, you're picking it up, up the story, you know, post 1916, right? And yeah. lay, lay out the context a little bit of the diplomatic relationship between Ireland and the United States in this, in that early period and how you would uh, characterize it. Well, there, there clearly were these close links between the, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the uh, Irish <laughs> revolutionaries the, uh, uh, in, in both the United States in, and Ireland, uh, the United Irishmen and uh, uh, the Clan of Gael, the United Irishmen in Ireland and the Clan of Gael in, in the United States. And, and they saw you know, immediately that uh, alliance with Germany would help, uh, uh, would, would appear to help uh, push uh, Ireland towards some form of, of self-government and, and independence. But, you know, as we, as we just mentioned, when the United States entered the war, that was an awkward <laughs> position to hold so that the Irish movement had to try to work within the context of the, uh, American, British, French alliance during during the during the war. So some form of of home rule or some form of of self government within the United Kingdom became a a a, 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 a topic that could be uh, pushed again. So there's a lot of work during the war, and of course uh, to to try to to try to come up with a formula uh, that would work. And of course, Wilson's um, war objectives, talking about self-determination uh, for, uh, uh, for subject peoples, uh, gave the Irish a, a, a vocabulary to use that was politically acceptable in the United States. Um, you also delve into how the Irish American community provides material support during the War of Independence. Can you talk a little bit about that, Francis? Well, that is, a, that is really one of the fascinating stories of this whole um, uh, elaborate uh, process. Uh, De Valera, as we all know, came over to the United States in, uh, in 1919. And one of his objectives was to, uh, uh, to launch a, a bond campaign to raise money for the Doyle government. Uh, and uh, that became a bit controversial, but in fact, he was able to put together uh, a, a, an organization uh, led by Frank P. Walsh, uh, for the most part, uh, to create a, a national organization to raise money. And there were several legal issues. It became, uh, you couldn't sell bonds uh, in the United States for a an unrecognized uh, government. So they became bond certificates, uh, certificates that could be exchanged for bonds when Ireland became independent. But the point is that they raised uh, over $5 million, uh, or $500 million, uh, no, $5 million, uh, in the end about 5,700,000, uh, which was a substantial amount of money uh, the, the Doyle 
in Ireland raised about uh, um, 300,000 pounds, which came out to about, uh, uh, what is it, uh, one, uh, uh, one million uh, uh, 390,000. Wow. So that the Doyle government money uh, was largely raised in the United States in 1920 and 1921. So this is a tremendous boost to giving the, the Doyle government uh, from 1919 on uh, the revenue with which to carry out uh, many of its uh, political functions. Um. Wilson as a character in this period, uh, Francis, and can I ask you, you know, you, I, you've, you've, I think you've thought a lot about him in the context of this chronology and things like that. Can you characterize for the uninitiated amongst us, um, like, where do you come down in terms of Wilson's attitude to Ireland or to Irish America more generally? Um, could you give us a sense of that? Well, uh, Wilson is a, is a difficult and complex person, but I, I think he's, um, he's not altogether fairly uh, 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 considered by, uh, by many of us working in this area of, of the, the Irish story. Uh, Wilson went out of his way uh, at the Paris Peace Conference and indeed before to try to push the British government to, uh, to resolve the, uh, the Irish question in some workable way. And arguably the, the uh, Irish uh, convention of 1917, 18 is, is one of these. Uh, but once again, at, at, at the Paris Peace Conference, he talked to Lloyd George and he had his, his, his advisor, uh, uh, Colonel House and his secretary of state, Robert Lansing talk to the British about the Irish uh, question. Now he couldn't bring it up, you know, in, in the uh, official meetings uh, of, the, uh, uh, of the Paris Peace Conference. Uh, he couldn't really upset uh, the, the, the question of, of resolving the war with a workable treaty with Germany and a reorganization of Central Europe. Uh, but he could make these private conversations uh, but unfortunately, the British did not respond uh, for their own, just as they had not <laughs> carried out home rule uh, in 1912. Uh, the British did not react. So uh, Wilson, I think, is, is somewhat unfairly criticized for not achieving Irish independence at, at the Paris Peace Conference. Uh, that he failed, I think, is, is the... Uh, uh, the responsibility of the British uh, as much as, as anything. But it certainly uh, uh, put Wilson uh, in, a, uh, in, in a politically vulnerable position. And uh, one of the points I try to make in the book is that uh, uh, in, in some respects, the uh, failure of the peace conference to make any progress on the Irish question uh, alienated the Irish community uh, and helped contribute to the anti-peace uh, conference and anti-League of Nations sentiment in the United States. And, and so one of, the, uh, one of the factors in the defeat of the League of Nations uh, can be attributed to the, uh, to the Irish hostility uh, as a result of the failure of Wilson to, to make any progress on the Irish question. Not the, whole, not the entire reason, but it's a, it's a major factor. This is, once again, this large community uh, who were quite disillusioned by Wilson uh, by late 1919 and 1920. And, and, and you, you'd say, Francis, that historically we've been overly critical or, or kind of one-dimensional about Wilson in, this, in, in, in his portrayal? Is that what you think? Well, I, I think so. By, by, the, by, by the time poor Wilson left office, he was pretty hostile toward the Irish. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but he had, he had, I think he'd done as much as could be expected. Uh, so I put the blame on the British <laughs> rather than Wilson. <laughs> um, now, the U.S. government is also, um, as, as is outlined in the book, is the first to recognize uh, 
independent Ireland and to interact with the head of the Irish government when Cosgrave visit um, and uh, the Cosgrave visit and Kellogg visit in the uh, 1920s. Can you tell us a little bit about that, Francis? Well, I think this is a, a really interesting story that's that's just begun to be told. Uh, uh, Bernadette Whalen's book on on uh, Irish uh, uh, U.S. relations in the in the 1920s is is very good, and she's got a new book out on uh, on on uh, Irish American relations in the 1930s, which is really excellent, uh, also. Uh, but uh, this has not been. Uh, not been pursued very much until just recently, but it's an interesting story from a number of points of view. Uh, but the United States, of course, having had this Irish community pushing uh, both the, the, uh, uh, the president and the State Department and Congress to, uh, uh, to open diplomatic relations with Ireland, uh, the US was prepared to do so within just about a year and a half of the Irish Free State coming into existence. Uh, and there's a wonderful uh, uh, subtext story here in that the Canadians uh, in the First World War and the aftermath had, had negotiated with the British to establish separate diplomatic relations with the United States because it was so complicated, particularly during the war, to uh, keep uh, uh, working relations between Canada and the US if they had to go through the British embassy. Mm. So the arrangements were made for Canada to, uh, uh, to have uh, separate independent relations with the United States. But the, the Anglo-Irish Treaty gave the Irish Free State the same rights and powers as Canada. So negotiations began almost immediately after the Free State came into function to open uh, diplomatic relations with the United States. And the United States was agreeable uh, then under President uh, Calvin Coolidge. And so in, uh, uh, in 1924, uh, Timothy Smitty, who had been uh, uh, the agent of the Doyle government and the, the uh, free state government uh, going back to at least 1920, uh, uh, became the first uh, Irish minister uh, to the United States, and uh, the consulate was elevated to a, uh, a consulate general, uh, and within another uh, couple of years, uh, a U.S. minister was sent to Ireland as, as well in, 19, in 1927. So diplomatic relations uh, with the Irish Free State were opened, uh, which was symbolically very important in terms of uh, the idea of whether Ireland was an independent country or whether it was still a colony of, of Great Britain. Mm -hmm. uh, diplomatic recognition constituted uh, the definition of independence sovereignty uh, in, in, the, uh, in the 1920s and, and for some time before as, as well. So symbolically, this was very Im important. Uh, and then the, uh, uh, the tour of, 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 of Cosgrave to the United States in, in 1928 was one of what was an amazing event in, in itself. This is before heads of government went back and forth across the Atlantic uh, as, as a regular feature. We're, we're quite used to that. Now we see pictures uh, of the president in the White House sitting next to uh, the head of, a, of another government. But in the 1920s, this was uh, uh, almost unheard of. Uh, uh, Briand had come to the United States during the, uh, uh, the Washington Naval Disarmament uh, uh, discussions in 1921. But to have a, a uh, he was part of the French, he led the French delegation to that conference. But to have the head of a government come as a, on a special visit and to be hosted at the, uh, at the White House and to be uh, given a dinner by the State Department and uh, uh, to be uh, uh, invited into the, uh, the, the House of Representatives and the, and the Senate. This was absolutely un unusual and remarkable. So this was, this was a very generous public recognition by the United States of, of Ireland's independence. 
Uh, and then Kellogg's visit to Ireland later in 1928 uh, reinforced the same, uh, the, the same sense of public recognition. And, and for, you know, you, you'd have to think, uh, Francis, and you, you, we would probably know from the sources on the ground in terms of for Irish Americans who had, you know, witnessed events, you know, take it from 1916, you know, through, you know, to the late 20s and stuff like this, to, to see a state visit occur in that way in the aftermath of the War of Independence, the Civil War, everything that had gone afterwards, it, uh, to your point, it must have been an amazing affirmation for many of what had had been achieved, notwithstanding, you know, that for those for whom partition would have would have remained a disappointment. Yes, yes. And, uh, and certainly there were these uh, these disappointments of uh, part partition of, of several other issues the the the, uh, the threat of uh, uh, of army <laughs> dissatisfaction and the, and the whole civil war had 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 really kind of cast a shadow over the fact that Ireland had some form of health uh, self-government and the uh, the republicans of course denied that that dominion status constituted a uh, uh, any form of meaningful independence that Ireland was still a colony uh, in the in the view of many Republicans, but uh, in in a in a very real sense, these public gestures by the United States uh, uh, serve to to show that that within the international community, at any rate, uh, and certainly official uh, American uh, views were that Ireland was an independent and sovereign state. And I think, Francis, for our, you know, people tuning in today, one of the things that's important to assert in the context of, you know, the, the diplomatic linkages and the symbolism, as you so finely outline, um, the power or the, yeah, the, the centrality of New York, not, not New York, of the United States, at New York to, to a big, a large extent, but the United States more generally as a place which was influential on public opinion so that when these like Irish issues made the New York Times and the Washington Post or whichever uh, newspapers and, and that those kind of centers where it, in which public opinion could be formed or changed or shaped and um, it, it wasn't insignificant um not only the demographic weight of the irish american community but th that 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 power to shape public opinion and mold it on the global stage you'd agree with that yes yes uh it here again this is a you know a really interesting story and uh, arguably, some of the tensions in, in the United States currently about immigration, you know, have their roots in, <laughs> in the <laughs> in the impact that that the Irish community had on what was an Anglo-Saxon, uh, a largely an Anglo-Saxon uh, Protestant community, and here were all of these Irish, most of whom were Catholic, uh, in the in the United States, and and there was a, a a great deal of hostility, uh, both towards the Irish ethnically and, and toward the fact that they were Catholic mm -hmm. in, in large major uh, throughout the 19th century and right into, uh, uh, right into the early 20th century as well. I think by the time we're talking, the Irish had, had established themselves as, as, a, as quite a respectable and prosperous uh, community. Uh, and there were lots of very successful um, uh, Irish entrepreneurs and industrialists um, and public figures uh, by, by this period. But there still was a, a surprising amount of, uh, of hostility and partly because uh, within certain parts of the community, they were disloyal to our gallant allies in the First World War. <laughs> <laughs> so that that uh, that created a kind of tension, uh, which uh, which was overcome, but was a constant um, anxiety nonetheless. Francis, if I if I'm correct, um, am I correct in thinking that some of the research for this book um, was enabled by 
new records that weren't available in the past. Is that correct? Or am oh, I that's correct? absolutely true. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Can you talk to me a little bit about that? Well, it was it's it's wonderful that the Irish government has opened up uh, its records for this this period. Uh, I I was so delighted to get into the external affairs papers way back when they when they opened up, and now the the publication of the uh, of the foreign affairs um, uh, documents has has been wonderful. And of course, I was able to use those in the putting together this book. Whereas when I did my, my earlier research, I, I could find private manuscript collections uh, in various libraries in the National Library of Ireland, uh, for example, and in, in, in New York and, and, uh, and Boston, but the uh, official records were, were not available. So this, is, uh, this has been terrific. And, and in the last um, several decades, uh, marvelous, uh, uh, scholarly work has filled in the blank spots. Um, uh, the, the wonderful new uh, uh, biography, uh, uh, Galway's biography of Devoy and, and, and Michael Dorley's uh, biography of, of Judge Cahalan. And uh, uh, I, I did a lot of work on, on the relief effort in, uh, in Ireland. And uh, that's, a, that's an incredible story. And one of the key figures is the Dublin uh, Quaker, James Douglas. And I, I ran across his correspondence in, in the uh, Quaker uh, Historical Library in Dublin, but who was James Douglas? There was no filling in, but now there's a biography uh, of, of James Douglas and the, the, the Dictionary of Irish Biography has, has been a wonderful reference, but uh, scholarly works have come out steadily to fill in the background of these, these figures. Uh, we've had biographies of De Valera and Michael Collins, but all sorts of other new biographies just come out of about Timothy Smitty, the first um, minister, Irish minister to the United States. Uh, so gradually all this background material that, that enables you to, to kind of pull these stories together uh, is becoming available. And this is really a wonderful process that's gone on in the, in the last 50 years. Uh, which makes Irish history much more interesting and, and, and complex uh, and, and, and rich. Can, can I ask you, Francis, I'm not sure if I, um, I'm not sure if I know that much of this. How did, I mean, you've been working in the, on these themes for a number of decades now. How did you first get into this type of history? Because I, I, it strikes me that it, but, it wasn't the type of history that was mainstream. No, no, quite, quite, quite right. Uh, well, I, I, I have to admit, I kind of came in by the back door. Uh, I had uh, concluded that that the uh, the twentieth century twentieth century international rela relations were really dominated by Anglo-American relations. Uh, the Anglo-American relations began to improve in the late 19th century. Uh, the US uh, joining the, the First World War uh, was a major step. And then again, in the Second World War, Anglo-American relations were crucial. Uh, and then in the Cold War, the, the starting point of putting together NATO was really working out uh, uh, close um, uh, British American relations, but the the obstacle, the 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 problem for Anglo American relations was the Irish question. <laughs> but uh, there, there's almost nothing written about uh, the the that I issue. Tansel's book uh, on uh, uh, written in the mid 1950s talked about uh, the Irish question uh, in in terms of. Um, of, of uh, uh, tr trying to get independence or some kind of uh, uh, self-government. So that was a, a step in the right direction. And, and uh, uh, Alan Ward's book on Anglo-Irish uh, 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 American relations came out in the late 60s, uh, giving me a lot of worry because I was finishing my PhD when <laughs> that book came out. But um, that was the, the key to, for me, to try to figure out why uh, why the Irish 
problem was such an obstacle for so long. But of course, I've become completely engrossed with the Irish problem. <laughs> <laughs> rather than with Anglo-American relations. Well, we're, we're, uh, not, we we're not complaining, Francis. We're not <laughs> complaining. Any of us in the field, we're, we're certainly not complaining on that. So, I mean, I suppose, I know it, it, it provides such a fascinating, when you outline it in terms of uh, uh, the general thrust of the historiography to find uh, the Irish example objectively in that context, um, just it seems attractive, right, to, to kind of unpack some really interesting themes of how, you know, in an era of improved Anglo-American um, relations, presumably, um, I, I mean, I, I is this the era, it, it, when does this whole concept of the special relationship emerge? Is, it, is there already a special relationship? And I suppose in that the thorny issue of this little island in the middle that's you know america has to pay attention to demographically right well uh, that certainly was uh, the the, the uh, a, a driving uh, force i think in in the period we're talking about the the early um, uh, the early 20th century and right up into the 19, 1920s uh, i th i think world war 2 really uh, really changes that, and and uh, uh, Franklin Roosevelt uh, is uh, is not prepared. In a way, I think that Wilson was to uh, to try to in any way represent I Irish opinions to the British, um, and his 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 uh, uh, his his, con his his conversations with Aiken. In their famous uh, uh, meeting in what is it, 1941 or 42, uh, uh, Roosevelt's clearly unsympathetic uh, to Aiken's uh, request for um, for military supplies uh, dur during during the war. Uh, but um, uh, so so that the Irish question is 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 less of a factor. I think by the, by that time, although even after World War II, there are are, are bills introduced in uh, uh, in Congress to, to support uh, Irish claims of one kind or, or another, for largely for reunification. But um, it it was not a a, a powerful uh, element that it had been uh, twenty or thirty years earlier. I don't know, Francis, if I told you I did some research about um, a year ago, actually it's it's due out in a collection uh, shortly on Marcus Garvey and the Irish question as oh, he was evolving. Yeah, yeah the, mm -hmm. um, his movement. And what's so interesting in the exact period of your book here, um, how much he and people around him, but primarily he, he, uh, Marcus Garvey himself, how much they're looking to Ireland and what Irish Americans are doing in terms of the peace conference and everything like that. And, and this, the strategic decisions in terms of, you know, Dev going to the United States and the, the organizational, um, what would you say, infrastructure that's being put in place and everything. It's fascinating to watch from a Garvey perspective how much they're emulating what the Irish are doing in this context and trying to push on questions in terms of, you know, um, uh, you know, kind of uh, the uh, pan Af what will become the pan african yes it's really yes. interesting to look at it at, at it that from that perspective and the relative success of the irish uh, in comparative terms in comparison with other groups you know garvey is not the other there are other groups who are agitating in this period and it's really interesting to kind of locate the irish uh, in that wider context oh i think that that's going to be a very valuable study of it 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 does um it does highlight the uh, the fact that that the Irish are really pushing the edge of of decolonization and the recognition of of minority groups, uh, and I, I I think that's that's going to be a really a brilliant uh, study. But it 
it it's part of you know the the Indians um, were very much influenced, mm -hmm. uh, and Indian nationalism was very much influenced by what the Irish uh, were doing, and and for 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 some years, perhaps right up until uh, the post war uh, uh, period, and and it's hard hard to know how many other ethnic groups uh, or subject peoples. Uh, similarly saw in the Irish uh, the beginning of, if you like, decolonization. Uh, so I think that's, that there's, there's a lot in this whole area uh, left to be explored. Yeah, no, there's a collection coming out in that vein, Francis, actually with NYU Press, but, ah. you know, and it's, it's not only interesting to, to, you know, what I found particularly interesting is not only are the Irish influential, you know, say maybe as a historical example, but in real time, they're influencing what the other groups are aspiring to or asking for or, you know, shaping the, mm -hmm. the, the kind of even the verbiage around their, um, you know, uh, you know, Garvey, for example, calls himself the... Um, he, he calls himself the exact same title that De Valera, wow. uh, is it the president of the provisional government? Is that what he comes over as? Is that yes, what I think that's remember? right. Yeah, and Garvey does the same, uh -huh. you know, the exact same terminology is being used and stuff like that. Those little indications of um, the cross-fertilization and how, you know, influential, uh, influential Ireland is in that wider context. Francis, it's a pleasure to chat to you about this. Um, I, I could go on all day with you. <laughs> and um, I hope that that interview hasn't been um, too, uh, you know, the book is out a year and, you know, sometimes maybe maybe you've moved on to new research uh, 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 areas, have you? Uh, I've been writing book reviews. That's my... Uh... Okay. That's my response to the pandemic and self-isolation. Oh, and actually, that's that's a nice last question, Francis. Have you been pleased with how the book now we have the vantage point of a year? Maybe you've you've read some reviews and things. Are you pleased generally with how uh, it's been received? Yes, I've, I've I've I'm aware of two reviews and they were very generous. I'm very pleased. Good. Good. That's great. It's that's always there's a sense of trepidation, right? Oh, I know. Yes. <laughs> Well, Francis, thank you again um, for anyone who's watching or listening. Again, the title of the, the topic of our discussion today is America and the Making of an Independent Ireland, a History, uh, published by, um, written, authored, uh, the author is Francis M. Carroll, and it was published by uh, NYU Press in the Gluxman Irish Diaspora series. It was actually the first book in uh, that series, we were so thrilled uh, to collaborate with Francis and it's always a pleasure uh, to chat to you and to um, avail of this wonderful technology to connect us. And I hope it's not too long until uh, we see each other in person. Let's hope so. Thank you very much for having me. This has been thank, a, thank a great Thank you so pleasure. much, Francis. Thank you for doing this wonderful interview today. Goodbye now. <laughs>